Hey there, my sweet little squid. Oh, it's you. It's you. It's me. We're here again. We're locked in time forever. Why are we here? Why are we here? Why are we here? Who's ready for a knowledge bomb today? We're going to be mixing up an intoxicating elixir of motorcycle history and mimetic musings. Doesn't that sound fun? I've come up with a list of all of your favorite motorcycle brands, and guess what? They used to suck. If history has taught us anything, it turns out that unless you're Honda, making motorcycles that are both reliable and simultaneously cutting edge and selling a bunch is not a particularly easy feat. It stands to reason that many motorcycle manufacturers used to moonlight as weapons manufacturers to make ends meet. War is big business, baby. Many of the favorite motorcycle brands we know today almost didn't make it despite their influence, innovation, or racing pedigree. So today, come with me as we look at some of motorcycling history's near failures. Here are five motorcycle brands that almost didn't exist. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Before we get started, I'd like to shout out our community over at yamminoob.co. If you haven't heard by now, we've got an awesome community of all different types of riders on our member-exclusive Discord server. It is a super fun and welcoming place to chat about bikes, get advice on your build, or just swap some hilarious motorcycle memes. Community members get access to a ton of exclusive content as well. I've got a new weekly segment called the Yam Cam, a live stream where members can chat directly with me and get some advice or insight in a real-time setting. You might have seen these coming live on YouTube, but you can actually participate in them. As a bonus, every membership automatically gets you entries to win one of our giveaway motorcycles. Most recently, a member won our Triumph Speed Triple 1200 rr and we flew him out to Austin to give it to him, which was just really, really cool. Head over to yamminoob.co to see which tier level is right for you and get yourself entered to win. Again, that's yamminoob.co. We can't talk about motorcycle failures without starting with a brand near and dear to my heart, Triumph. Triumph was founded in Coventry, England in 1884 by a 20-year-old German entrepreneur named Siegfried Bettmann. 20-year-old entrepreneurs these days just want to hustle NFTs and start a dropshipping empire to fill the world with even more worthless garbage. How times have changed. Although it was not originally called Triumph, instead it was called the S. Bettman and Co. Import-Export Agency, it was decided that it didn't quite roll off the tongue, so they decided to change to the Triumph Cycle Company. The brand started by purchasing and rebranding bicycles before beginning their own manufacturing in 1889. Eight years later, in 1898, Triumph began planning to extend their production to include motorcycles. By 1907, Triumph had been grinding and manufactured and sold a few thousand motorcycles. Fast forward to World War I, and Triumph was able to ride their way to success on the coattails of the British military after they supplied the Allied forces with 30,000 Model H trusty Triumph Roadsters. After the war, Triumph began making cars as well as they purchased an automobile factory in Coventry. Coming hot after the Great Depression, the diversified Triumph brand began to split into different entities before being sold. Triumph motorcycles would become independent of their previous bicycle or car manufacturing businesses and were purchased by Jack Sangster, who owned the Arrival Aerial Motorcycle Company. In 1937, Triumph released the 500cc Triumph Speed Twin, which would become recognized platform for their twin motorcycles the next 50 years. It is at this time Triumph began importing motorcycles to the United States. Now, after World War II, Triumph began to have a serious impact on American motorcycle markets with bikes like the Speed Twin and the Tiger 100. Because Americans always needed everything to be bigger and better, Triumph made a 650cc version of the Speed Twin that would become known as the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird is a motorcycle ridden by a certain Marlon Brando in the Wild One contributing to the Triumph's brand recognition in the States. The Bonneville, a better performing version of the Triumph Tiger T100, was actually the catalyst that scared Harley-Davidson into making the Sportster since they had yet to produce a smaller, sportier Roadster motorcycle. So it was all sunshine and rainbows for Triumph until the mid to late 60s when Japanese manufacturers began building motorcycles that had better performance, more advanced technology, and superior build quality. Triumph, who at this point was owned by BSA, felt that they were safe as the big four had yet to make a large displacement motorcycle that would rival theirs. But then Honda dropped the CB750 and essentially took Triumph out the back of the shed and put it out of its misery. Honda and the rest of the big four were so quick to elevate the motorcycle paradigm that Triumph and by association BSA really didn't stand a chance. Riddled with debt, BSA was sold to the parent company of Norton Motorcycles in 1972, and Triumph still made motorcycles for the next 10 years, but failed to sell them in large enough quantities to offset their debts, and they went bankrupt in 1983. The same year that Triumph name and manufacturing rights were sold to John Bloor, who in less than 10 years, rebuilt Triumph into the brand we know and love today. Thank God, because otherwise we'd have never gotten a Triumph Daytona. But yeah, they came really close to never being brought back from the dead. 
thank you, John Bloor. Maybe we should start praising him instead of Rossi. Or maybe we could just do both. The next brand I want to talk about is MV Agusta. Oh my word, MV Agusta has a long storied history with similar ties to the military industrial complex. They originally were founded in Northern Italy in 1923 as an aircraft manufacturer. Following World War II, certain peace treaties forbid the production of aircraft in Italy. Luckily, MV Agusta, which at the time was known as, forgive my translation, Giovanni Agusta Aeronautical Construction, had already been secretly working on their plans for their first motorcycle, a 98cc two-stroke two-speed rudimentary bike known as the MV98. They then registered the name Meccanica Vergara, the MV in MV Agusta. This bike was released in two trims, Economica and Turismo. The latter a denomination they still use today came equipped with a three-speed transmission and rear suspension. Oh, that's pretty good. The Augusta family had passions for racing and sold motorcycles almost exclusively to fund their factory racing team. Winning races was the only priority for MV, and by the mid-1950s, they had developed larger motorcycles and won championships in a bunch of different classes. But during this time, the Augusta factory was again manufacturing aircraft, so the need to sell large quantities of exotic motorcycles just wasn't a priority, and they could bankroll their racing efforts with helicopter sales. By the mid-1960s, MV saw the same demand for larger production engines as Triumph and Honda did, but they created the first production motorcycle with a transverse inline-4 engine, the MV Gusta 600. This bike led to models like the 750 Sport and 750 Sport America, which were advanced for the time but could not compete with that dang CB750, which was only one-third of the price. Now this is where it gets a little crazy. 1971, Count Domenico Augusta, the owner and son of the founder, died and the brand gradually lost its vision. And he was the guiding force for their cutting-edge effort. By 1976, they were out of racing and searching for a financial partner to heal their woes. This new partner demanded MV cease production, and they had sold their last remaining motorcycle by 1980. In 1992, MV Agusta was purchased by the Castiglione family, who sought to revive the brand. They already owned Kajiva, Ducati, and Husqvarna at the time. This era ultimately led to the development of bikes like the F4750 and subsequent F4000 superbikes. But unfortunately, MV Agusta had not found its forever home and would be passed off like an unwanted foster child when Kajiva sold the majority of its shares to a Malaysian car manufacturer, Proton, who then sold it a year later to a financial holding company. And then you'll never guess who got their grimy mitts on the brand next. It was Harley Davidson, who then sold the company a year later in 2009. Luckily, during this whole time, Claudio Castiglione remained on as the president and the Castiglione family was able to buy the company back and regain control. Since then, they have taken on investments from Mercedes-AMG, who was subsequently bought out following the investment by the Russian Black Ocean Group, and the company had financial shortcomings despite sales growth over the last decades. And that's mostly where Envy is at these days. Maybe this should get back into aeronautics, because that is a crazy story. Okay, we're about halfway through the video, and it sounds like it's a good time to dog on America's golden child, Harley-Davidson. If you can believe it, they weren't always the preferred lifestyle brand of aging dentists and lawyers, but instead were a manufacturer of knockoff crap bikes. And coincidentally, it was just at the time that Honda released the CB750 and put a new threat into the world of motorcycles. Harley-Davidson was originally the brainchild of another 20-year-old, William S. Harley, and his friend Arthur Davidson. But this was 1901 when the life expectancy was 50, so I guess 20 is like nearly middle-aged. Like every other prehistoric motorcycle company, they began making engines designed to power a traditional pedal bike. In 1906, they built the first factory and began producing a couple hundred motorcycles per year. By comparison, their engines were large for the time with a 440cc single and an 880cc V-twin, setting the precedent for their large loping engines. During World War I, the US military purchased 20,000 motorcycles from Harley-Davidson. In 1920, HD was the world's largest motorcycle manufacturer. They were able to survive the Great Depression and were again commissioned to provide a large number of motorcycles for the US military during World War II. In 1960, Harley-Davidson bought 50% of the Italian company Ermacchi's motorcycle division and began importing their small displacement single-cylinder two-stroke bikes for use in the HD branded motorcycles. In 1969, they sold to American Machine and Foundry, AMF, who attempted to cut costs by outsourcing labor and sourcing cheaper parts. During this time, HD, under the ownership of AMF, eventually purchased the entirety of Aramaki and produced entire small two-stroke motorcycles under the Harley-Davidson name at their factory in Italy. In 1978, they actually sold the facility to the Castiglione family, whom I mentioned earlier in the MV Augusta section. During the late 60s and early 70s, Harley was starting to get a reputation for selling expensive, albeit poorly made motorcycles. 
All the while, the big four were coming in hard with industry-leading inline Ford UJM bikes. Nearly avoiding bankruptcy, Harley-Davidson was bought in 1981 by investors led by Willie G. Davidson, descendant of one of the original co-founders. Now free of the reins of AMF, Harley was able to improve the quality of their bikes, relying heavily on the heritage of the brand. This began a brand new era as it have to be recognized as America's most loved motorcycle brand. Not to imply it would have been free of economic hardship in the last four years, but as it stands now, it doesn't seem like they're going anywhere. But the history of Harley is much more complicated than that and we can't really fit it all into this one video too. If you ride a KTM, I'm sure you've experienced older folks coming up to you and saying, I didn't know KTM made street bikes, and that is because they didn't really until 1994. And for some older people, life hasn't changed much in their eyes since the early 90s. The founder of KTM, Johan Trunkenplos, owned an auto repair shop called Kraftahurzig Trunkenpols Matigofen, which essentially said motor vehicle, his name, and where it was located in Austria. During World War II, business was good repairing diesel engines, but after the war ended, business was declining, and Johan wanted to make motorcycles. In 1951, the first KTM motorcycle was made, the R100. They began producing bikes in 1953. Another owner bought into the company and the name was originally made Kronreif and Trunken Poles Mattinghofen, after the other two owners. Ironically, less than 10 years later, both original owners had died and Trunken Poles' son took over the company. During this time, KTM grew in size and production. They started to build their engines in the 70s and 80s and founded KTM North America in Lorain, Ohio. Sales of their mopeds and scooters rapidly declined just before the remaining trunk and poles air died as well, leaving an indebted KTM to creditor banks. In 1982, KTM divided up and resurrected. The motorcycle division invested heavily in new products and R&D. They put out new models, established their brand, and took place in motorcycle road racing. The 90s was a new era for KTM. They began their line of Duke motorcycles, established their signature orange colorway, and sold factory supermoto and adventure bikes. Presently, KTM owns Husqvarna and Gas Gas. Bajaj Auto owns 48% of the KTM Auto Group, which has led to their manufacturing of inexpensive bikes in India. But they almost didn't make it. Speaking of India, the last brand I'd like to talk about today is Royal Enfield. Royal Enfield is another old as hell company that dates back to 100 years and has military ties. Albert 80 won a contract to supply the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield Middlesex with gun parts. Uh, that's that phrase could probably get us demonetized on YouTube. I just want YouTube to know it's the name of a place, Middlesex, and I'm just saying gun parts. I'm not saying the S word and the G word together. Relax. The Enfield Cycle Company combined with BSA made gun parts and pedal bikes and bike parts. They made Royal Enfield Bullet Motorcycles, which in 1952 was found suitable for the Indian Army to use to patrol its borders. After supplying almost 1,000 units, the British Enfield Company partnered with Indian company Madras Motors to assemble 350cc bullet motorcycles in India. Eventually, Enfield India had all the tooling and manufacturing capabilities to manufacture entire motorcycles from scratch, and so did alongside the English Royal Enfield bikes until 1971, when, you guessed it, English Royal Enfield bikes couldn't keep up with the big four in quality sales or innovation. Wow, common theme here. Royal Enfield has grown exponentially in India since 1955 and has even sold more motorcycles globally than Harley-Davidson. It is likely safe to say, had the entire company not been sold and moved overseas, it probably would not exist today. So there you have it, five motorcycle brands that have had some close calls. Isn't it interesting how every one of these companies has had some sort of military deal and how Honda almost killed every single one of them? Fascinating, truly. And for those of you who waited this long to hear me talk about Indian, that is too obvious and I've been talking about them too much lately. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. I'll see you later. Fact, Cap'n Crunch's name is Horatio Magellan Crunch. Goodbye. Keep watching Amy Noob!